by the way, I'm not an ANCAP. So don't even don't don't hit your wagon to me on that one. NCAP is an anarchist, anarcho capitalist. Yes, yeah. not a, not an NCAP. Uh, they have nice book bookshops. Yeah, they do. Way. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to you know sit here and and shit talk ANCAPs. Uh, although I also used to get into the conversations with uh, with uh, an ANCOM uh, anarcho communist, uh, a good friend of mine, and he would he would bring up this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, cool, man. I'm down with anarchy you ain't gonna like it like, what so, do you mean i go because i'm gonna take all, i'm gonna <laughs> gather all kinds of people together. i'm gonna make this i'm gonna get the strongest together and yeah. i'm going to take your shit okay <laughs> can i ask you on that uh, topic i've um a friend of mine now uh a fellow russian uh ukrainian uh michael malice oh I, yeah i'm familiar with michael malice <laughs> i watched a little bit of your guys is uh conversation so <laughs> this is really good to ask you because uh I like you're, how he's in the white suit and, and, yeah. and you're in the, the white and black. Yeah. But he, he lives in New York City. Mm -hmm. He is uh, espouses ideas of anarchism. Mm -hmm. And his idea, and this is different than um, sort of the Ayn Rand uh, set of ideas, that there's a line between sort of capitalism that's backed by the state and mm -hmm. just pure anarchism. And his idea that violence won't take over uh, in an anarchism is one that feels to me not grounded in reality. I may be, I, I may be wrong. So is there some, so uh, the idea with pure capitalism is that. You mean laissez-faire, completely deregulated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well what it, it will agree, the, it'll end up in one, it'll end up in, if, if you're anti-globalist, it's going to be that. It's going to be globalist a hundred percent because it has no, con pure capitalism has no consideration for uh has no consideration for your your native users or of any sort like yeah, it, it land doesn't, doesn't matter and but the idea of governments is that the land the little piece of land you're geographically you're born on means you're going to stick to whatever founding documents mm -hmm. created that little land so anarchism is against that and the argument is you should be able to choose which ideas you live with mm -hmm. And the concern there is nobody, uh, th this geographical little land, the governments mm -hmm. that organize on that land will not, do not need to protect you from the violence. And my sense is there does need to be an army, there does need to be police that help, well, however the form that police takes, but there needs to be a s more centralized, not completely centralized, but more centralized safety net of, to protect you from the violence scale again right so if you want to have your anarchist utopia well what we want to call it utopia, your anarchist uh, creation here at certain scale i'm sure it's doable you know um but as it scales as the scale increases it's completely untenable and a state will emerge a state will always state, emerge because emerge, because yeah. even people always think of states as as like people rubbing their hands and smoking cigars in back rooms yeah. and just out of nowhere coming around it's like oh well, we're going to create this big centralized thing and just so that we can tell everybody what to do and we can be in charge i mean i know that there are people like that that exist that they would like to do things of that nature and that they see uh, the use of power as something to be used more for their their personal gains over first which again self-interest in human beings but um uh but, eventually but a state people want a they want something to go like okay who's taking care of this and who's taking care of that and who and how do we create some sort of uh some sort of pr uh protocol for this like okay well when it's not bob when is it Susie? when is it whatever i mean like how do we you know, it's got to get done if we want this thing to become bigger. If we want our all of our plumbing to to work right. If we want, it's just I'm sorry, a state's going to happen. A state is also, when you think about it, is supposed to have consideration to tribe, right? So if people think that we're not tribes, well, you're not you're not really thinking very deeply. We're all tribes of a sort, and uh, I, everybody likes to use the word tribalism and this idea of of, of this uh, antagonistic concept, but and while sure tribalism can be antagonistic tribalism can also be uh, a positive thing or i could just say it just seems to be a natural thing people you know they create their their groups of one sort or another and so 
when you have, well, when you think about where, when nation states really started to become a thing, uh, and I don't mean even the more modern looking variants that we could think back of and say the 19th century or something like that. Right even older than that. I mean, do you think the Assyrians didn't have a state of some sort? Of course they did. Um, they, how do you increase your, 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 your empire if you don't actually have a place to start from? Has to be a ruler. So you're saying like naturally, it, when you start talking, thinking about scale of humans, naturally states emerge. And so can we try to make an argument for anarchism? Which is, uh, okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Me, uh, <laughs> so uh, anarchy in a sense is an opposition to the unhelpful, unproductive, inefficient bureaucracies mm -hmm. that eventually the states lead to. Yes, so, and that's what we can see. I mean, I would say less anarchy, let more study James Burnham, you know, uh, or, well, any anybody that wants to talk about the the managerial problem and the managerial. I see. So you you have a sense, a hope. Maybe let's think like, what is the path forward with the inefficient state? Is it revolution or is it to work within the system to constantly improve it? To <sighs> Man, I don't better? know that one. I mean, my general sense, uh, and maybe this is the Nietzschean part of me, is that yeah, it'll it, it would take. Maybe not even just re maybe not even defining uh, it specifically as revolution. Maybe it would just take just total calamity to to get people to stop people being up. shitty, to not stop being a lesser version of themselves, to stop thinking more about uh, things from you know, the paradigm that we exist in now, where we're we're giving so much value to stuff that isn't really all that valuable. Yeah. You know, where we're so concerned about likes, and I don't just mean like whether we get them or not. But that, oh man, maybe we should take this off of our platform because this is too destabilizing to people. And it's like, because once you exceed Dunbar's number, I think it's actually without having the right faculties, which would need to be developed because this is dealing with, this is dealing with tech that brings things, ways of approaching being that we are not naturally programmed to be able uh, to handle appropriately yeah. so and i think as even 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 more it's even more detrimental to women than men because i think uh women have a more natural proclivity towards um uh group association and uh, and and more group oriented thinking and patterning and now and with also coupled with seemingly more sensitivity towards towards human uh states so i feel like women like the, the classic idea is like oh you know women are psychic you know they have a sixth sense and what have you and i think that's just a uh, uh a way of uh simplifying what i think is that women may be more in tune with picking up on the unsaid like they might be better at at, at seeing um uh, physical cues, uh, inflection and tone, like different, like they may be far more sensitive to these things, which to me would make sense because dealing with children that can't uh, communicate uh, so, so generally more distinctively in all the full forms. Right of now, okay, now whether it be a woman or a man, but especially with even the social uh, push on this concept of empathy, which of course it gets to the point where it loses any meaning anymore. Like people use the word empathy in absolutely incorrectly all the time and they don't even understand what you're really asking of people but let's just take it as as we're using empathy in the correct sense yeah. and you're taking on the emotional content of the thing itself now you open that up to thousands of people maybe hundreds of thousands of people all across the world that you will never meet that you will never know that you're not even getting an actual true representation most of the time of who these people are you're you're meeting persona and some of these personas are de even deliberately created to elicit a response inauthentically. Are you referring to bots or uh, could be artists? bots or actual people? Bots are one thing, but I mean there are literal people out there that will create something, create uh, GoFundMe's for for tragedies that never didn't really or events that didn't happen or any number of things. Okay, I mean, burn their own house down and then say, you know, we were attacked. 
And then it comes down, oh, you did it to yourself because you wanted money and empathy and this, that, and the, you wanted all this, this emotional wealth, let's say this emotional uh, coin, mm -hmm. as well as actual, if possible. You wanted to leverage it in some way. That's not the majority of people, but at, I would say a good amount of folks are thinking, well, if I post this photo, um, and I put this little blurb in there, I bet I can get this much cachet out of it in this sense. And I'm not even, and this isn't just a reference to like butt pics and stuff like that, because clearly, obviously, people understand that that uh, our inborn uh, sexual nature is easy to manipulate. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty pretty obvious. But you're, you're, you're saying this kind of new medium of communication on social media is, uh, is is unnatural and it preys on us and so as you you want this you know you look at you look at an anarchist kind of mindset right and so you're just like there's no there there is no overarching state to to create any kind of uh structure right and so if you have that unfettered capitalism aspect with it and before I say anything particularly damning about unfettered capitalism, uh, I'm a massive capitalist because I view capitalism essentially as what it boils down to. Uh, I get these arguments with people too. They they start giving me all these extra definitions about capitalism. I'm like, no, no, this is obviously some sort of theory you're taking from other shit, but that doesn't describe capitalism. Capitalism is the ability for us to create whatever we want, you know, create our, our thoughts, ideas, physical things and trade them freely amongst each other uh, in, in ways that we find um, acceptable, mm -hmm. right? You know, I'm not even using the word fair because I might think it's fair to me. You might think, huh, well, I mean, that was actually, I think he, what he thought was unfair to him and it's more fair to me. Yeah. And then someone, a third observer goes, oh man, you should have, you should not have paid that for that. You should have paid this. And it's like, well, you know what? It works for me without- it's Sufficiently acceptable that you, uh, you both agreed to the transaction. Correct. And, uh, you know, but, but also at the, at the root of that is freedom, right? And as far as I can tell, I've been banging this around in my head. It's like for every one unit of freedom, you need two units of accountability. <laughs> and if you don't have that, what you end up with is, it's human self-interest we're not even going to get into evil human self-interest sabotaging other things even not in a, in a sense to be malicious okay so in terms of uh let's let's put this as mathematically speaking i love this so uh, anarchism is more like two units of freedom and one unit of accountability or maybe yeah. zero units of accountability. Possibly, I mean, the <laughs> anarchists tend to think like, no, everyone will be accountable. It's like, yeah. the fuck they will. <laughs> when, when have you seen this happen in real life? Yeah. You know, I mean, people aren't even accountable in their revolutions half the time. <laughs> so uh, you aren't looking at the way people really are. It's like, Marx is like, yeah, the, the people are like this, they're like that. Look at how capitalism does it. I mean, he uh, of course assigns a lot of really ridiculous economic principles and practice uh, but and also assumes that everybody you know who makes any profit from anything is somehow stealing it and you know really assigns a negative moral aspect to them and then it's like oh yeah but then eventually communism will happen every, no one will act that way anymore and you're like whoa hold on you just said that people yeah. are all are you saying it's all due to capitalism or it's is it innate it's just it's a fundamental un misunderstanding of and it's like hey Look at you. You're like a notorious, like anti Semitic, angry, like uh, just absolute curmudgeon of a human being who seems to be really not all that fun to be around. Marx? Yet, yeah. And then it's just like. So you have to think, like, if, if there was one billion Marxes in the world, they how would, would they all, behave? It would be absolute. <laughs> <laughs> they would hate each other so bad. And. You know, this isn't for me to even poison the well on Marx is like, oh, his personality sucks. It's like, there's lots of people whose personality sucks. Yeah, that doesn't mean they can't make, I, I don't know that his name, what? You know, somebody argues. He's, he's just a, he's a loner. I mean, I don't know that his personality sucked at all. Let me walk that back and that he was human. Uh, saying his personality sucked. He was sometimes contradictory, yes. irrational. Sometimes he was uh, quite, sexist despite the emails i've gotten that uh that that's the emails i've got that, that told me that uh that there's there's people who's written to me that uh, nietzsche has been unfairly labeled as sexist 
in his tre- discussion about women. Mm. I'm pretty sure there's a bunch of documents where he's just like, he's just a bitter guy. I, well, I, I will agree with you. And Marx is as bitter as they come to, but um, you know what? Bitterness in and of itself doesn't make like, what, why I, I hate Marxism comes from, you know, the, the whole, the, the entirety of the thing. And, but the dismissal of human yeah, nature, but, but I'm not lie. going to say that Marxism or practic man, you can find any forbidden book and it, it could have something good in it. As kernels a good idea. Yeah. And like at the end of the day, you know, Marx is a human being. Yeah. He's got a nice beard. Yeah, he does. He had a hell of a beard. Yeah, a decent portrait. I mean, he looks like the kind of guy like I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley, but thankfully I don't think he was much of a fighter. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but in any case, I mean, not, not the anarchists are are, 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 they're more hot for like uh, Max Stirner. People like to think that uh, Nietzsche borrowed a lot from Stirner. And my argument is one, you don't have any real evidence for that. And two, bullshit. <laughs> you know, I mean, anybody could, I, I, the fact that they have some overlapping thoughts doesn't make it, uh, lifted not to mention go read a lot more philosophy and see how there's so many different things oh this guy said it in uh 1722 well and then this guy says it again in 1922 does that mean he read the other guy's stuff not necessarily i mean he's working from the same type of human uh, physiological construct as anybody else like of course it's possible that this guy could think the same thing we we think a lot of the same things to be perfectly honest i mean reading the hagakure going back to philosophy books this was really impactful on me as a younger adult because here's a book written in the 19th century about someone who lived through uh, the 19th and 18th century at times as a samurai, now a monk, and his objections to society at the time, the same objections one was having to society as I was reading it. Like the same human behaviors, the same uh, uh, impetus for action that he found uh, a problem like, well, that's the same, that's the same shit now. Like, mm-hmm. we're not, and this is the thing, and then I'm reading more religion, I go, oh, we're no different than anyone who wrote the Torah or older. Yeah. We are the same thing with the same problems, with the same uh, psychological issues, the same human behaviors. Like, these things are not different. Yeah. And we haven't changed. A growing set of tools, though, to, to kill each other with or mm-hmm. to communicate together and all that kind of stuff, but underlying it, there's a human nature. Well, we're also trying to understand that human nature. I think we've, just like you said, learning how to fish, acquired more and more knowledge about mm-hmm. that human nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's been a very slow journey, it's slower than people realize. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. In terms of understanding uh, human nature. Let me ask in terms of egoism, I'd be curious uh, <laughs> to, to get your sense about Ayn Rand and mm-hmm. um, her whole idea of virtue of like selfishness. Sure. And her, because you mentioned that everybody has a kernel of truth. There, There's potential for a kernel of truth to be discovered in, any, in anything.